I know very little about Africa. You know, I know a lot about America and Americans. So in reality, what I want to be called basically is just a man, you know, period. Yeah, my name is Anthony Bajet. I'm from Portsmouth, Ohio, in Southern Ohio, on the Ohio River. A close-knit, tight-knit black community, which there was a whole number of these along the Ohio River. I went to school uh, in Portsmouth, Ohio. Uh, then I went to Miami University to study psychology and theater and a little bit of music. Then I went to work at various places uh, working with children. I went to uh, Cincinnati, worked at St. Joseph Orphanage. I was in New York working with gangs and uh, various other places. So anyway, when I went to D.C., was working for the uh, Washington, D.C. Mental Health Department, uh, met a young lady in, uh, 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 who was from Berlin. She said, well, you know, Anthony, if you feel like it, you know, come and visit in Berlin. I said, okay. Year goes by, then I had to get out of America. It, it didn't matter where she lived at, if she lived in London. Amsterdam, didn't matter. I, had, I was leaving America. I wasn't coming to Germany, I was leaving America. Now this was in December 19th, 1981. The wall was up. There was, they had the American sector, the French sector, the uh, British sector, and the Russians in East Berlin. Uh, it was, uh, you can't compare it to what Berlin is now. And it was culture shock, you know, for me. You know, I grew up in America and in the uh, uh, late 50s, early 60s, and through the 70s, that's where I was at. And coming here and seeing all the GIs, for example, the British GIs, the American GIs, the French GIs, uh, and then going to East Berlin, it was, and you know, it was a culture shock. Being born in America, in Southern Ohio in 1952. Well, and from uh, in, in Portsmouth, as I said, we had you know black doctor. We had a, a, one of the first black, if not the first black police chief in America. I didn't have a white teacher until I was in the seventh or eighth grade. Uh, so we had our own teachers, barber shops, uh, car mechanics, uh, and our own, we had to build our own swimming pool. Uh, my parents and my uncles and aunts and some other uh, uh, older generation uh, built our own swimming pool because we weren't allowed to go swimming. And we ended up going either going to Ironton, which is like, I don't know, 35, 40 miles away, or you went to the Ohio River. And when a lot of people started, black folks started drowning, well, you know, we had enough of fighting to go swimming. So my parents and that generation, they built the, our own swimming pool, which is still there. We declare our right on this earth to be a man, to be a human being, to be respected as a human being, to be given the rights of a human being in this society, on this earth, in this day, which we intend to bring into existence by any means necessary. So with that, you know, I grew up with a, a, a sense of community and the value in that and the strength in that and the pride and dignity and integrity that came with having your own, you know, uh, instead of relying upon somebody else to do it for you and re especially relying upon the American government. So this was during the 50s. Uh, my first recollection was when I realized, you know, we had all black, when I played basketball, I realized, okay, my goodness, there's all white basketball teams. You know, I didn't dawn on me that we were all black, because that's all I knew, you know. Uh, 
And then you start realizing, you know, let's say 1960, you start realizing the racism. You couldn't avoid it. You know, it was every place. You know, trying to go to school, uh, football teams. We had all uh, uh, black, a lot of black players, but no black cheerleaders. Uh, never had a black coach. Uh, and so these are things that I thought you know, should be corrected. You know, we, we deserved that uh, and earned that. So, I don't know, going to high school, where I went to high school at, I can say it was actually a good experience. Portsmouth, Ohio was probably, at that time, one of the, one of the most progressive little cities in America. Uh, and we didn't have too much fight. We had, you know, your normal, you know, high school fights or whatever, but it wasn't like, you know, we hated each other. Also, we had, you know, a skating ring where we could, under black people, could only go skating on Tuesdays and Thursdays. So you had that. But we tried to overcome that. And how do we overcome that is, you know, why go to places where you're not wanted? Just because you can say we skated with these people. Uh, or we went to Woolworths and say we had a cup of coffee at Woolworths. You know, that, that's, that doesn't mean a lot to me. What means more to me in my community was that we got our own place. We don't have to go to World War and get beat up to sit down next to a white person and to have a cup of coffee. We know it's all right, but is it worth getting beat up over? Okay, so just have our own. Beyond the wall, to the day of peace with justice, beyond yourselves and ourselves, to all mankind, freedom is indivisible. All, all free men, wherever they may live, are citizens of Berlin. And therefore, as a free man, I take pride in the word, Ich bin ein Berliner. Growing up in America, only place I'd ever been before I left America was uh, uh, Jamaica. That's it. So growing up there, that's what I knew. That was my comfort zone. And then coming here, leaving you know, leaving America, and coming here was a, uh, just doing that. You know, your anxiety level is so high because you have no idea, no idea what to expect. You don't speak the language. You know. Uh, around just all Germans, but a lot of them didn't like you. Uh, uh, you had the American GIs, the French GIs, the British GIs, a big wall around the city. You couldn't just come and go as you please. Uh, uh, that's, I mean, my goodness, if you could imagine that, like if you just could imagine moving from New York to Miami, don't know nobody, no one person, so you, you're anxious, of course. So with that in mind, you know, coming here, getting on the plane and flying here, I was like, okay, what am I, what, what am I getting myself into? So, okay, the first thing I looked for was some other black folks. You know, who can I communicate with? You know, it's hard to communicate with people who you can't understand them because they speak another language, and let alone, you know, uh, uh, come from a whole different culture. You know, like I said, the black GIs, I don't know, uh, some of them were cool, some of them would just join the army just to get out of America to get insurance and but didn't really have you know we, we couldn't really communicate uh, and then you know they had the discos uh, uh, that you could go to that that was a culture shock first disco I went to here was called the talk of the town uh, I go in there it's all black men and all white German women then that was a culture shock to me You know, i never seen that, you know. Uh, and the owner was black. What I learned in America, and I brought that with me, so it was very difficult to find people here who shared that same frame of, frame of mind, that same attitude about life, that same attitude about community, uh, uh, so, and about theater and art and music and having our own. Uh, uh, there was three or four people. I started meeting some uh, uh, musicians, 
uh, Jay Oliver, uh, Floyd Brothers, James Chaney, and uh, we used to hang out at a place called Babanosa up in Moabit. And, you know, poets, dancers, writers, uh, Cecil Brown used to hang out there and with some other people. So we formed a, you know, a, a close-knit little, you know, group of artists. And Bob Lennox was there. And uh, so we used to perform together. And you have to realize that at that time, you know, saying something bad about America, uh, you could get in trouble. This is during the Cold War. You know, that's uh, literally Berlin had more spies in the, than any other city in the world, and including black GI spies, and there's a few here still that were informers. Their whole job was to find people that were bad apples, so to speak, you know, in the military. You know, people that were against the war or, you know, and if you were a communist, you surely were watched by the Americans. Uh, so you had a lot of people who spoke out behind closed doors, but didn't have the nerve to speak out in public because they was on, you know, in the military. There were no big demonstrations. The most demonstrations were at the, uh, the place called America House. Uh, those were the anti-American demonstrations. And there was one every weekend. Anti-America, down with America. America, get out of this place. America, get out of this. You know, it was just all over. Uh, so. To speak out politically, you know, as a GI, they didn't do it, you know, so, and there weren't that many other, you know, people who came here not in the military. And so to find those few people, oh my goodness, I wouldn't hung out at. So I was fortunate enough to uh, uh, meet some people uh, just because I was the bartender at the film building at Steinplatz. So uh, my, my first job here was uh, uh, mopping the floor at an office. That was my first job. Uh, then I became the bartender, and then the cultural program manager. Then I started meeting the uh, the black uh, artists that were here, and some we're GIs who decided to stay here to the end. Uh, when their when their their, to their tour the of duty uh, ex expired. Now a lot of fine musicians, fine fine writers, uh, fine you know. So, but uh, there was still something missing, and and the overall overall scheme of things and what that was missing was a sense of really community overall community because a lot of these guys were going back and a lot of them you know were in culture shock you know uh, uh, things were just a different culture you know and if you didn't want to hang out at discos hey there wasn't too many places you could go so we created the Bob and Nosa where we could go discuss who we are our lives you know, what kind of legacy are we going to leave, you know, uh, uh, and those were great, I think, mental stimulating times here in Berlin when the wall was still low. Uh, now when the wall came down, it took a little time for that. You know, I've also been asked, you know, do I consider myself African American, Black American, you know, uh, or just plain American, you know, uh, as American, I really, you know, ain't so crazy about being associated with America, period. You know, it's embarrassing sometimes to say I'm an American. Uh, African American, I use that term mostly when I'm around white people. You know, uh, I don't think I have to say African American around my other brothers, you know, we just say black American. If we talk about that, we just say black American because we take it for granted we black and our ancestors came from Africa. So to make that clear distinction, uh, uh, I say well, to white people, that's my ethnic background as far as back as, you know, my ancestors go as Africa. You know, uh, talking to Americans, uh, you know, I'm just a I'm just a, a black American and dis distinguish myself from, you know, uh, uh, white Americans, basically. I know very little about Africa. You know, I know a lot about America and Americans. So, you know, I'm, 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 a, I'm a, a black American. In reality, what I want to be called, basically, is just a man, you know, period. You know, but that's not going to happen in, in, in my lifetime, you know. But as long as I got to identify you know, it's with, it's with black and Africa. Africans that were here had clubs for the uh, 
the white Americans. You had, it was violent times between the Americans, white Americans and the black Americans. You had rednecks, Ku Klux Klan members here at a club called the White Horse. Then you had the clubs for the uh, 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 brothers and sisters. The talk of the town, the sheep, uh, the jungle, uh, sugar shack, silver wings, and that's just a few off the top of my top of my head. Uh, so it was just I don't know how to explain that. Just different. Okay, let's see. Let's jump around to 1989 when the wall came down. Uh, complete chaos. Complete. I do mean chaos. A lot of jubilations because the wall came down, and a lot of uh, Eastern Europeans, you know, came to Berlin. Uh, as well as a lot of uh, artists, a lot of opportunities. But with the jubilations came a lot of uh, hate. Uh, Nazis went crazy. They took advantage of the chaos, uh, throwing people off s bonds getting beat up. I got stabbed myself, you know, getting beat up. Uh, uh, the areas you were scared to go, even when they had the World Cup here, they had a no-go a no -go, uh, uh, zone where they advised, if you're coming here for the World Cup, don't go here, you know? Uh, uh, so that caused a lot of people, you know, that's when, you know, Black History Month got started in 1991, 92. Uh, we felt the need to unite, so to speak, you know, to protect ourselves. Uh, now, as far as the Africans and uh, black Americans, African Americans, uh, I think it, it, we understood, you know, uh, the necessity of working together and trying to, at that point, you know, trying to help each other. Uh, there were a number of places where, you know, a number of clubs that we could play at. We a lot of times played together. Samba Sox, Suleiman, Torre, Wusi Tusi, uh, uh, Fawasi Abdul Khalid, uh, Charles Wynn, uh, Loomis Green, uh, Jody Carlo, myself, Sharifa. Uh, we, we all performed at a place called the uh, Delicious Donuts on every Sunday. And uh, we were able to pay people more than they get paid now. Uh, now, as far as uh, why, why, and what changed between the Africans and African Americans, I really don't know. But something changed, you know. Uh, uh, then they become, you know, places where Africans performed that, you know, and then Americans were playing a lot of jazz and and funk and stuff. And there are places they could play at. One of the few places that both both gingers were playing at was the Junction Bar, but they didn't pay no money. You know what I mean? Brothers are getting ripped off left and right. And uh, uh, they even have uh, a policy at one point that if you're a single black man, you couldn't get in the club. So that was when I stopped playing there, period. You know, uh, I didn't play there very often, but in some sense of way, there was starting to be a little a little unity, not much, but a little bit, uh, and a lot of times because of the, uh, the violence. Now, what the overall German society, of course, they wanted to sweep it under the ground, and you know, uh, we even had this, uh, what is it called, Guardians of the Angels, you know, Guardian Angels. They were here riding in Ubar because there's so much violence on public transportation that the uh, Guardian Angels came all the way from New York to, to protect people riding the Ubar. So, that would you would think that would let everybody know, hey, we need to really be together, you know. But it didn't. Yeah, 1989 through 1995, uh, I think was the height of uh, here, black unity until 95, 96. Then the things just fell apart, you know. So uh, I got no real answer for it other than, you know. Uh, the people just got egotistical, like the ISD and this of the black Germans, they tried to copyright Black History Month. I'm thinking, how is that any, who, who, who does that, you know? Uh, uh, and arguments during Black History Month, you know, uh, arguing over who's going to get the weekends because that's when the money was there because they had parties, opening party, you know, uh, closing party. It got so bad that one, one, one February, the uh, uh, 
the last day of February, ended on a Tuesday, right? So they extended Black History Month until March because they could take advantage of that weekend, the first weekend in March. So uh, uh, they didn't take themselves seriously. It was all about the money. That's all, you know, and the, and the opportunities was there. We just didn't take advantage of them. Man wächst auf, eigentlich liebt man seine Mutter, aber trotzdem ist man seine Cousine gefühlt. Hört auf damit, es bringt uns nicht weiter, es ist auch nicht cool. Weil wir leiden darunter, das ist unsere Kultur. Wir leiden darunter und die Menschen freuen sich, dass wir uns selber wissen. Die freuen sich, dass wir uns selber zerstören. Wir können das nicht mehr tragen. Wenn wir wirklich eine Veränderung wollen, müssen wir uns auch verändern. Hintereinander stehen, auch ich bin nicht immer stark. Ich fühle mich auch einsam. Und deswegen bin ich hier. Weil ich das brauchte. Dankeschön. There's a lot of racial violence. Es tut weh zu sehen, dass die Leute manchmal, wenn sie mich auf der Straße sehen, denken, das muss ein Araber sein, vielleicht eine Türke, hm, vielleicht aus Ägypten. So zivilisiert Deutschland auch ist, fühlen sich die Menschen manchmal unsicher. Wenn sie ihre Freunde mit den Worten Salam Aleikum begrüßen, das Wort selbst bedeutet Friede sei mit ihnen. Es ist nicht schlimm, aus einer dieser Länder zu kommen, denn ist es ein Privileg, aus einer dieser Länder zu stammen. Unsere Geschichten, unsere Vergangenheit, unsere Kultur, unsere Tradition, die von Liebe, Freundlichkeit und Menschlichkeit geprägt sind. Deshalb bin ich stolz auf unsere Vorfahren. Es ist schwieriger, Schmerzen zu empfinden. Es ist viel schwerer, nicht zu fühlen. Das ist der Grund, warum ich mich hier manchmal wie eine Ausgestoßene fühle. Aber das ist jetzt mein Zuhause. Das ist mein Staat. Strong sisters and brothers back then, you know, Eva, Danny Hofka, Maya, the poet, uh, Jay Oliver, Floyd Brothers, uh, some other African brother, Prince, uh, and you know, we did unite because we had really didn't have much choice because brothers were getting like you know beat up, thrown off S bonds, uh, stabbed, uh, uh, so we kind of had to, you know forced to unite for safety reasons. And I think at that point, Black History Month started out as, you know, trying to unify the different black communities, you know, here. And the, uh, the most militant that I saw were the, uh, what was it called? African, African, African Women's Initiative. Uh, and they wrote some very strong theater and uh, were very militant, you know, very outspoken, well-educated, well-spoken, and, you know, uh, uh, didn't pull no punches, you know. Uh, but, you know, so, so then when it seemed like, you know, everybody was bad, there's some really good, strong people here, and it's unfortunate that they're no, they're no, no longer here, discussing how we could, you know, improve our condition here. Well, you know, maybe you go there, maybe there's 10 people. You go to the disco, you can't even get in, you, you know? So, and you know, some serious writers that were here. So, you know, there were some strong people. Then you had the other people who were very egoistic that has been around, you know, as long as I have, you know, and it's just unfortunate, you know? It's just really kind of, you know, hard to understand. But as a black man, you know, 
we go through so much stress and drama on a daily basis. Uh, hey, I'm, I'm Valentin and uh, I know Anthony since I'm nine years old and uh, well for me he was always also not just a coach always like a type of father also and um, now it's ten years ago since I since I know him and he's a very passionate Coach, that, that, that's for sure. Ähm, ich kenne Anthony seit drei oder drei, also drei vier Monaten. Ähm, er ist ein sehr guter Coach. Er bringt uns viele gute Sachen bei. Er ist ein Coach mit viel Energie. Er versucht uns alles äh, so schnell wie möglich beizubringen und es macht immer wieder Spaß bei ihm zu trainieren. Uh, Anthony uh, was my coach for last years and this years. He improved my game, especially in defense. He is really good in defense and sometimes a little bit hard, but I mean, he he is really good coach, and he really helped me to to become the best version of myself. You know, in all these years that I've been here, okay, we we got the Clear Blue Water, our own association. We got our own basketball club, which is ours. You know, uh, we got all black coaches. They get paid. Uh, uh, so, you know, I've done a lot of theater here, uh, sponsored myself. You know, produced it, directed it, and hoping that you know somebody else would you know take that baton and run with it you know and carry on that legacy so we got a, an association called clear with water we got money in the bank money in the bank we can't find nobody responsible and reliable enough to take we give them the money hey are you gonna do a sign this paper this belongs to you you got money in the bank you got a reputation all the things we've done over the last 20 some years you know it's already there you ain't gotta do nothing but continue you know uh, uh, our basketball program we didn't have a lot of good players we got trophies you know we got re well respected now here i am at 69 years old trying to get some of the brothers and sisters at least to come to practice and help that's it. Just can you come and help? I'm 69 years old. Been doing this for a long time. I kind of want to retire as a game coach. So I'm like, okay, can somebody come by and help? Can't find nobody. You know, like we got games. I'm wondering where are these where are these these people's parents? You know, I wouldn't think about uh, uh, allowing my son to go play basketball with, and don't know who the coach is. It wouldn't cross my mind to do that, you know. So I'm wondering how come these parents don't come by and meet us and see who we are, and you know how we deal with these kids. We mentors. Well, last 40 years of my life, uh, 35, 37, 36, something like this, been in Germany. I came here in 81, went back to America in uh, 85, and then came back to Germany in uh, the end of 88. Uh, my experience in America at that time during the mid 80s 
this is it's fearful. The crack epidemic, going to prison, prisons are full. You know, I was just one foot out of jail for or being killed. So I came back to Berlin. Uh, so when I came here, a little bit before the wall came down, I made my, you know, connections. Uh, has a lot of ups and downs here, you know. Tried to survive on, you know, playing music, which I did for quite a while. Uh, tried to do my best to promote uh, black culture, regardless of African or American, you know, black culture through poetry, theater, uh, uh, music, dance, uh, and the need for us to work as one. Uh, had a lot of successes with that and some failures. And it was a failure because we didn't take advantage of it. We, we got together in February. That was it. You know, uh, we didn't do nothing the rest of the year. So my whole purpose of doing Black Kids a Month was to say, okay, let's start this in February and continue it on the rest of the year. You can't live on one performance in February, but that never happened. So we started to look at here magazine, which we still do. Uh, uh, we video as much as we can. We do our culture and sports exchange where we travel with our players and our students. You know, we went to Chicago, London, Prague. Uh, I don't know, you know, what else one person can do. Uh, so in these past 40 years, uh, uh, it's been pleasurable and miserable sometimes. You know, the the pleasant thing is the the young young kids, youth that we've been able to help and open their eyes. And now a lot of them are doctors, lawyers. We even got some police officers. We work with basically Turkish and uh, Afro-German, I guess you could say. You know. Uh, I, I don't like to use the term people of color, so uh, we got a lot of those. Uh, and we, you know, uh, uh, talk to the parents. We have a community unity day uh, uh, every year where we get all the parents, all the players, present, past, and uh, uh, in the future, I hope, you know, to come to, we barbecue, play games, just get to know each other, which I think is what's missing. So that in itself, you know, uh, uh, has done wonders. You know, I've talked to white kids who've never had a conversation with a black man, never, you know, and may never have another one after they, you know, uh, stop talking to me. Uh, so, you know, these things, you know, the kids will remember going to Chicago with 15 teenagers and, you know, uh, living in South Chicago, talking to kids, interviewing kids. We, we videoed the whole thing. They, these things they will remember forever. And that's one thing I can say I'm really proud of. That's one of our, I, I hope, you know, many legacies that people will remember these things, what we tried to do. Uh, so the last, you know, the Blues Cafe, the Clear Blue Water Association, which is our political uh, uh, association, uh, our basketball association, which we run control, has done a lot uh, uh, for younger people. The older people, I don't know so much about. I've kind of given up a lot of times on, you know, some of the younger generation. They don't listen. They think they know it all, you know. Uh, uh, and as a person my age, be 70 my next birthday, you know, black men, women my age, we, we, we walk in history books. You know, I think it's frustrating for all of us to, to see somebody you know what they're doing is not going to make a difference whatsoever. We know that, you know, demonstrations, chanting this and that, it ain't going to make much of a difference. You know, you got to, you know, you got to organize, you know, and learn how to boycott, learn how to be, you know, speak up, don't be afraid and, you know, make sure that somebody's got your back and that's what's lacking. You know, we so much into our own lives that we don't even notice sometimes that somebody needs a little bit of help or that person needs help is too, I don't know, proud, vain to ask for help. Uh, and that's what's lacking here. You know, when I grew up in Portsmouth, everybody helped everybody. You couldn't go no place. 
with somebody not knowing who you were, not knowing your parents, you know? If you needed help, food, it was there, you know? Here, I don't know, it doesn't exist. We try to start a, an Arctis emergency fund, you know? Our, all that everybody got to do is put in five euros a month. We could, you know, have a fund that we control, you know? So we did it ourselves. We still got money in the bank, you know? Just in case artists might need some money, in hard times, and these are hard times. That's looking ahead. Here, you ask a brother, you know, what's your plans for the future? They look at their watch, you know. So, what can you, what can, what can you do? And the only thing I can say we're doing now is we want to have a uh, May is Black Future Month. You know, that's our next project, uh, so to say, not project. You know, next thing that we want to do. Uh, the past is the past. If you don't learn anything from the past, I mean, the future looks bleak. So that's what we're looking forward to is uh, the future in a realistic, with my eyes wide open, you know. And it's a pity that I don't even rely upon brothers sometimes. It's a shame. But I love my brothers and I understand what they've been going through. I love my sisters. We just need to get together. That's it. And talk and learn from our mistakes and don't get all defensive, you know, about it. Just learn from it. All right. Somebody, all you had to do was move to the middle. The defense just need to clap. Hey.